Hey. Welcome to the Student Society's Focus Week, The Hidden Public Sphere. My name is Yuri Kozik, and I'm the host tonight. Every semester, Student Society chooses one topic to fill up the entire week. This fall, we decided to talk about views which are not well present in Norwegian public debate. And some of the views are those that you can definitely disagree with or kind of be very at odds with. But at the same time, we still believe that it's very good to discuss them because it's very easy to, di to disagree with the views that you never discuss. Therefore, tonight we're going to talk about the relation between morality and welfare state. Many Norwegians believe that or are proud of welfare state, brown cheese and a national costume. While two latter things you can hardly accuse of anything, the former, the welfare state, meets a, meets a pretty strong criticism. Alike to people who can be immoral or unjust, a state can be based on immoral or unjust principles. Ayn Rand is an American philosopher and writer who stands strongly against the welfare state. And tonight, we have a privilege to learn more about her views. Our tonight's guest is Jaron Brook, an executive director of Ayn Rand Institute in the United States and one of the champions of Ayn Rand's views. He will hold the lecture for 45 minutes, and then after a short break, we'll have a Q&A section open. In order to let anyone to speak out, we'll limit all the questions to two and a half minutes. Please keep it in mind. And now, let's welcome Jaron Brook with our warmest applause. to be here. Thank you all for coming out on this, uh, on this rainy night. So I've got a tough task before me. Uh, my task is to critique the welfare state in a country that loves the welfare state. In a country that seemingly, I would argue at least, the welfare state has been an enormous success. A country where people are living relatively wealthy lives. Uh, where people are, uh, seem to be enjoying these wealthy, wealthy lives. Uh, a country which seems to be incredibly successful, so why critique it? Why not emulate it? Why not copy it? I'm going to suggest tonight that there are basically two reasons that I don't want a welfare state. I don't want other countries to copy what you have. One, because I think ultimately, economically, it is suicide. And two, I think morally, it is wrong. It is immoral. Now I'm going to spend most of my time on the morality case, and I have to admit in advance, I'm not an expert on Norwegian economy, uh, but I want to hit on a few key ideas about uh, the economic case for against the welfare state, because I think that leads importantly to some moral, uh, some moral ethical implications. So you Norwegians are pretty lucky, right? You sit on a massive reserve of oil. Uh, you have access to the latest, greatest technology to get that oil from the deep waters of the North Sea. And you've been milking those revenues for years. And you've been smart about it. You have to give you credit, right? You've been smart about it as compared to other countries that have had been lucky at times in their histories. You've put a lot of the money aside. You've got this massive sovereign wealth fund that is accumulating huge quantities of money. You know, I think the last number I saw was something like $800 billion, but I, you know, who knows what it is at any given point in time. So the success of the Norwegian system is, in my view, from an economics perspective, to a large extent, an issue of luck. Luck that your neighbors, for example, in Sweden haven't had. So their welfare state basically went bankrupt in 1994, and they've been frantically over the last 20 years trying to unwind it, trying to undo it. 
You're also lucky, as are your Swedish neighbors and your Finns and, and Denmark, that there was a period in your history, a long time ago, before you guys were born, that Scandinavian countries were indeed not welfare state countries, quite capitalist and quite free, in which a lot of wealth was created, massive amounts of wealth created. Uh, I know a little bit more about Sweden, but Swedish companies were some of the most dominant, uh, most successful companies in the world during the late 19th century and early 20th century, and massive quantities of wealth were produced. So that when the shift to socialism happened, or to welfare, we don't like the word socialism, I guess. When the shift happened in the 50s and 60s, in the late 50s and 60s, there was a lot of money to redistribute. There was a lot of wealth that had been created during a period of free markets, during the pre-welfare state, and, you know, it was redistributed freely in the 60s and in the 70s, and as I said, by the time 1994 came around, that money ran out. Sweden was basically in bankruptcy. Indeed, if you look at the top corporations, top businesses, top producers, top creators of industry in the world today, you do not find that many Scandinavian companies anymore. Uh, particularly now with Nokia, which was a, something like a fifth of the Finnish economy, one company, uh, having uh, kind of crashed and collapsed. So, you mean lucky because you have oil, you mean lucky because you had a lot, a period in which you were free to create lots and lots of wealth. I think yeah, Sweden discovered the, the, the wealth that was accumulated in the past was gone. And then of course the question is what's going to happen to your oil? Um, oil prices are going down. North Sea oil is relatively expensive. Uh, you are going to be facing real problems. And it's a real question of what, how the Norwegian economy adjusts and whether the Norwegian economy is structured to adjust to lower production of oil to a situation where you're not getting oil profits uh, on a large scale to re be redistributed. I also find it ironic that the reason you can make so much money off of your oil is because other countries around the world are not welfare state countries. That other countries around the world have chosen economic systems that distribute a lot less wealth, that are far less socialist, and therefore are growing far faster than you are and therefore have a huge demand for that oil that you produce and therefore you benefit and therefore you can redistribute and pretend that you have a model that fits everybody in the world. It doesn't even fit you. You're dependent on other people being capitalists to some extent or another. Over the last 30 years, you're being massively dependent on the fact that Asia has abandoned systems of egalitarianism, has abandoned systems of socialism, in favor of, have a, of, of a strong emphasis on market systems, whether these are the Asian tigers initially or China in the last 20 years. That's what has driven the oil price up. That's what allowed you all to become rich. But it has nothing to do with what you did. It's luck. It luck's good. You don't enjoy it while you can. But you should be aware that it's rare that luck is sustainable. Luck runs out, and you need to be prepared for that. So what is the fundamental kind of economics of a welfare state? Take the people who produce the most, who work the hardest, who create the most value, tax them as much as you can with the hope that they won't stop working hard and producing a lot, in order to distribute their wealth, distribute their money, to people who either can't produce anywhere near as much, or won't because they're lazy or for some other reason they don't feel like it, won't produce as much. And it's dependent, of course, economically, on the idea that some people will continue, 
over time to produce more and more, in spite of taxing them more and more, that they will continue this behavior, which is very, um, I don't know, counterintuitive. You know, the harder you work, the more I whip you. <laughs> At some point, people are going to wake up and say, enough. I mean, my guess is that's already happened in much of Scandinavia, where the best, the ablest, the most productive have left. Or are just not working as hard, not working anywhere near their potential, not producing or creating anywhere near what they could. Because why? When it's just going to be taken away from them. And given, so you have massive negative incentives in any kind of redistributive economy. Negative incentives to work, negative incentives to produce, and of course the flip side is you have very positive incentives not to work, not to produce, not to, you know, really engage in activity that is required to sustain kind of the high standard of living that we've all become accustomed to. So, you know, uh, uh, Norway today has a, a very high cost of living because everybody expects a very high salary uh, because you can afford right now very high salaries because of the oil, not, not so much in Sweden and even in Denmark. Uh, you have lots of sick days, double many other countries in terms of sick days, uh, because why work? You get paid the same amount. And, and it's legitimized, this idea of not working is legitimized by the whole welfare state. The whole welfare state says, don't worry, be happy, we'll take care of you. And we'll take care of you at a pretty high level. So, why work? The negative incentives are immense. Norway is experiencing declining productivity. Worker productivity is in decline. Uh, and uh, massive underemployment. People just achieving less than they could. People working less than they should or could be working. So a lot less economic growth than what's potential. So as rich as you might be, as rich as you think you are, you're a lot less rich than you could be. In fact, you're a lot less rich than a lot of countries that redistribute wealth a lot less than you do. The United States, for example. Now, the United States is not a capitalist country by far. It's a mixed economy. In many ways, it's a welfare state. It's just less of a welfare state than you are. We redistribute less than you do. But by almost every measure, we're richer than you are, which is not surprising. There's all the incentives suggest that we would. We live in bigger houses. <laughs> we have more toys. Uh, we have nicer cars. Uh, disposable income in the United States is significantly higher than in Norway, significantly higher than Scandinavian states. This is just numbers. These are just facts. You can dismiss them all you want, and you can go and do the research and discover that they're true. Uh, in real terms, the average, and I'm talking about average standard of living, and this, you know, the average is being pulled down in America in ways that it's not being pulled down by a four and a half million population of pretty homogeneous people. In the United States, the averages are pulled down, and yet the averages are higher, substantially higher, than they are in Norway. But even more so, you know, uh, if you look at states that have a lot of Norwegians. Now, I don't actually know that this is true because nobody's done the research on Norwegians for whatever reason, but they've done the research on Swedes. So people look at average life expectancy in Sweden, it's higher than America. But Swedes in America live longer than Swedes in Sweden. Swedes have a pretty high income. Average Americans have higher income. But Swedes in America have even higher income than average Americans. Uh, happiness, there's a lot about the happiness indexes. Right? You guys seem to be really happy. Same thing. If you, uh, if you ask Scandinavians in America, third generation, fourth generation, doesn't matter how happy they are, they score about the same as you guys do. Um, and it's not surprising. The whole idea of asking people how happy they are, uh, is, it's, it's predominantly a cultural phenomenon. Right? And I can tell you, you know, I'm Jewish, I, I grew up in Israel, 
Uh, and uh, if you ask uh, uh, people from my culture if you were happy, we'll always say no. Because <laughs> we're supposed to complain. It's part of the culture. Right? If you say you're happy, people look down on you. They look, you know, something's wrong with you. <laughs> so another of the measures that, measures that you think you're incredibly successful, uh, that, that, that the welfare state has been an incredible success, when you actually look at the numbers, when you actually look at the figures, and you take away a lot of the noise around them, yes, you, you know, you're doing well, but economically, from a purely economic perspective, you could be you could be doing so much better for a highly educated population, for a population that was as productive, as innovative, as creative as Scandinavian countries were when they were capitalist pre-1960. You're just scraping the surface of what you could be, where your lives could be from an economic perspective today, and all in the name of equality, redistribution, and so on. And I'm not even, you know, we could go on and on in this, but, uh, you know, most innovation, let's take healthcare, for example, where I'm sure you pride yourself on your socialized healthcare, as, as most countries that have socialized healthcare do, and yet you're completely dependent for every innovation, for new drugs, for new techniques, for new medical devices, on the least socialized medical system, in the world, which is the United States, which generates well over 75% of all medical innovation. If we socialized our system in the U.S., innovation would collapse, everybody would suffer, including you. <laughs> you would, because you'd have less innovation. You're free riding off of the fact that the United States doesn't have socialized medicine. And good for you for free riding. I have no problem with that. It's just worth pointing out. So, Two points I make on the economics, and then we'll move to the ethical issues. One, you could be richer, you probably could be happier, you could be more prosperous, you could have more toys. Um, and I'm not sure what you have is sustainable. Given all prices, given the future, if, uh, if the world economy starts, growth starts shrinking in China and other places, and all prices collapse, I don't know if what you have today, if what you take for granted today, if this is sustainable, and I don't think that you have an exit strategy, because you're so committed to this redistribution of wealth, you're so committed to this pool of money coming in that you can massively redistribute on a regular basis, what happens if it goes away? And what happens to the mentality that is developed, this entitlement mentality, when you can't afford to feed it? So, not sure it's sustainable, I'm pretty sure it's not. And you're missing out, could be even better. But what is this welfare state really built on? What are the assumptions behind it? Because at the end of the day, nobody advocates, oh, I shouldn't say nobody, most people, most economists, don't advocate for a welfare state because they believe it generates the most economic growth. Most people know it doesn't. They don't advocate because they believe that the welfare state the welfare state is not there to produce wealth. It doesn't do as well as freer economies. We know that. That's a given, I think, in the world around us. So what does drive this desire for a welfare state? And I think at the end of the day, this is about ethics. This is about morality. This is about what we think is right, what we think is just, what we think is fair, not about what we think about money and how much money we're going to have, and, and issues like that. It's about fairness, justice, morality. And what is it about morality? Well, what are we being taught? Goodness, fairness, justice, nobility, what ethics, what are we taught ethics is about? From when we basically were in this big, when we were toddlers growing up. What did our mothers teach us about being a good person. Well, she taught us, that, well, I shouldn't talk for you, I'll talk about my mother. My mother taught me that to be good, to be noble, to be 
just, be a good person, moral person. You should always think of others first. You should think of yourself last. You should work to make other people happy. You should make sure that other people are not in need, are not suffering, are not... And not think about the cost to you of helping them out. That the focus, from an ethical, moral perspective, should always be on other people. How they are doing. Taking care of them. And indeed, this is what we're taught by every moral philosopher, by almost every moral philosopher, by, by, by all the preachers, all our religious leaders, and all our mothers. We're taught that the essence of morality is to take care of others. And this is the essence of the welfare state. The welfare state is based on this notion. There are people, we are all in reality, in the real world, we're all unequal. Some of us produce a lot, some of us produce a little. Some of us work hard, some of us work a little. Some of us make a lot of money, some of us never do. Right? For a variety of reasons, we're all unequal. And as morality tells us, in some fundamental sense, that's just not right. Those who have stuff should be helping those who don't. Those who have stuff should be giving to those who don't. It's their duty, their moral duty, their moral obligation to sacrifice. And the welfare state is a way of institutionalizing sacrifice. Because the fact is that left alone, people don't sacrifice enough. We know this. They, they just don't give enough. I mean, there's a lot of charity that happens in a free market, but nowhere near as much as would generate the kind of relatively egalitarian state that, for example, Norway or Sweden or Denmark are. What we need is the state to come in and help us sacrifice more. And indeed, we don't object to the state doing this, or very rarely do we object. We encourage it, because our mother taught us that helping other people is right, that sacrifice is noble, sacrifice is good, being selfless is the standard of morality, and therefore what I should do is give to those people, but I don't really want to because, you know, that new iPhone 6 is coming out and I need it, I want to buy that or I want to buy a new car. And I know I won't do enough, so when the state comes to me and said, look, we'll just raise your taxes a little bit, that'll make you feel better because you're helping those other people, then we say, absolutely and we vote for it. And it's self-perpetuating. There's always somebody who has less than you. There's always somebody who needs something. You are always going to be filled with guilt because what? You're living one life. You're living, you're creating, you're producing for you. You're not giving enough. And they come to you and they, you know, and it's fun. And we all vote for it. In America, now again, most of my experience is in America, in America, this happens all the time. We just, uh, uh, we just had a referendum in California to raise taxes on rich people. Right, from 10% to 13% this is an income tax on top of the federal income tax. Uh, and uh, California has voted to increase taxes on rich people. And you'd expect rich people to vote against it because phew, why would they want to increase their own taxes? And yet rich people overwhelmingly voted for it. Why? Because they felt guilty. These people over here need stuff. I have it. I'm not giving out of my own free will. So force me. That's okay. And that's the key to the welfare state. The welfare state is about forced sacrifice. It's about coercion. It's about taking money by force from some and giving it to others. Now we vote for it, but it's still coercion. See, my view... If my neighbor has a problem, I don't know, he, he, he's sick and he doesn't have money to pay for the operation or he doesn't have food to feed his kids or whatever the reason is, he's short on something, he's, he's, he needs, he's in need. I believe he only has two options. He can come and he can ask me for help and I might help him or I might not, depending on what else I have going on in life. Or he can come to me with a gun. You Norwegians have lots of guns, I understand. <laughs> like Americans a little bit. And he can take my money. But those are the only two options. Now, when we're dealing with one-on-one -on -one situations like that, we all say, well, 
Him taking your money is wrong. That's called stealing. And since we were this big, we were taught that stealing is bad. But then there's this magic that happens. Instead of actually pulling a gun on me and taking my money, he hires a third party to do it. Call it the IRS, or I don't know what you call it in Norway. <laughs> and they steal my money from me and give it to him. Of course, there's a bite, there's a process in between where everybody votes to steal my money, and as long as they the majority votes that it's okay to take my money, somehow we pretend that it's not stealing anymore. Something happened because we voted that took something that if we did one on one, we'd consider it stealing and made it suddenly something that's legitimate. But that's what it is. That's what the welfare state is. The welfare state, from a moral perspective, is a theft. The stealing of some people's income, some people's wealth for the sake of other people. It's not an appeal to some people's generosity and saying, hey, you want to help them? No. It's a direct appeal to the gun, to force, to coercion. In the name of morality. Because morality means sacrifice. And if you've got a lot and you have to give a bunch of it up, big deal. Who cares? Right? You're only doing what is right and what you should be doing all along. So the whole basis of the welfare state, in my view, is theft. It's organized theft legalized theft in the name of a morality of sacrifice. And the moral code, selflessness of sacrifice, legitimizes that. Everybody says that's fine, who cares? Now it also has this whole redistribution of wealth, has negative moral, I think, implications to everybody involved in it, as theft will. Theft is bad for you, both if you're the crook who's stealing the money, or if you're the person who's getting mugged. Both parties, in my view, at the end of the day, are worse off for stealing. The welfare state creates an entitlement mentality, and a mentality that says, I deserve, give me. I don't think that's a healthy for a human being. I don't think it's productive for a human being. I think it's hard to be happy. It's hard to be successful when you expect people to give rather than you do, rather than creating, rather than working. It creates an environment of envy. Because even in Norway, not everybody's equal. You can't be. Just look around the room. You're, we're all different. There's no way to make us equal. No way to make us equal. I like to, I like to uh, you know, how do you make me and Michael Jordan, remember Michael Jordan? I, LeBron James, you probably know who LeBron James is. How do you make me and LeBron James equal in basketball? How do you make us equal? In, I, want to be as, I, want to, I want to be able to play one-on-one -on -one with LeBron James and have a chance to win. How are we going to do that? Yeah, because I can't, you're never going to train me to be as good as LeBron James. We're not equal. We're not the same. So the only way to put us on a basketball court and for us to get close to one another is to break his legs. So anyway. Now, if you'd ever watched me play basketball, you would know that that's probably not enough. <laughs> you'd probably have to break at least one of his arms. Now, we find that unpleasant. Yuck. Breaking people's legs. That's horrible. It's okay to take 50% of their money. That's fine. 50% of their money that they spent 50% of their time producing and making. It's okay to enslave somebody for 50% of his time for the sake of somebody else. That's fine. But breaking legs, oh no, we'd never do that. I'm not sure what's well, what I'd prefer. Having my legs broken once a year or 50% of my income taken away from me once a year? Think about it. I'm not sure. Money buys. Money's life. Money buys you time. Money buys you life. Money buys you the ability to live and thrive and succeed. It's not just the pieces of paper that people are taking away from you. It's your time. It's your time living that is being taxed away from you. So this whole entitlement mentality produces 
a, a society in which this, these kind of sacrifices are taken for granted. We shrug at them. We break people's legs and we think nothing of it. It also produces a society, as I said, where we're, because we're not equal, at the end of the day, even after we try, even after we break legs, of envy, of resentment. If I'm still poor, I'd be told I should be as wealthy as everybody else, and somebody else is wealthier than I am, then how dare he? How dare he? He owes me. My moral code says that he owes me. Because he has more than me, because I need and he has, that creates a debt. And when you have that kind of mentality, that only creates a sense of envy and resentment and people being unhappy with one another. So, I think a welfare state creates a horrible environment, a horrible place to live, a place where people don't respect each other at the end of the day, because they know some of some of some of some money's being taken from some of recipients, and everybody resents everybody else. The people whose money is taken away from resent the people who are getting it, who are not working. The people who are getting it want more because the people who are being taxed have more. So why not get more? Finally, I want to say something about the harm I think that the welfare does to those who receive welfare, particularly to the poorest who receive welfare. So I believe, and I'll elaborate this in a little bit more, but I believe that one of the ways, one of the most important ways in which we attain happiness as human beings is by attaining self-esteem. It's by attaining a certain sense of confidence in our own ability to live, to be productive, to take care of ourselves, to be in this world and know, I mean, I get a lot of satisfaction knowing I'm feeding my family. I'm working and I'm feeding my family. They are not going to go hang hungry because I can take care of myself. That gives me an enormous sense of self-esteem, of self-confidence, and ultimately, I'm happy because of that. Because I know that in this world, I'm competent enough to survive. This is not a hostile world to me. I can, I can do pretty well in it. What happens when you take somebody and you give him a check, and another check, and another check, and you tell him, don't work, don't produce, don't take care of your family, we're taking care of them, so don't worry about it. What you're telling them is that they're useless. What they're telling them is they're incompetent and they shouldn't have self-esteem because they never will have self-esteem because they'll never have that sense that they're taking care of themselves. They are dependent and they know it and it destroys them. Now in the United States this is evident because what we've done in the United States through this welfare system is created a class of poor people who are always poor. Not because they're not evil, not because they can't produce, not because they can't create, not because they can't become rich, but because we've made them dependent. Why should they try when they keep getting a check? And what we've done is not just institutionalize them into poverty, which is horrific enough. What we've done is institutionalize them into unhappiness. We've institutionalized them into low self-esteem. We've institutionalized them into a horrific way of life. And that's what happens when you keep handing a check to people. I mean, this is, parents should know this. And I don't know how your parents are. But at some point, you got to tell your child, go and make it for yourself. And if you don't, then they'll never gain the self-esteem and happiness and success that a human being is possible to a human being. It's capable of it. A human being is capable. So to me, the fact that we deny a class, a whole class of our fellow citizens, our fellow men and women, the ability to work and produce and create for themselves is enormously detrimental to them. It's a crime against them. And in my view, the biggest 
the biggest uh, victims of the welfare state, the biggest victims of the welfare state, are the ambitious poor who will never live up to their ambition, who will never have the opportunity to exercise their ambition, who will never have the opportunity to make something of their lives because they've been institutionalized into this process of getting checks from Uncle Sam or whatever you call it, Aunt uh, Norway. <laughs> So let me end by talking about an alternative, my alternative. Ooh, I'm running out of time. We started late, right? Okay. So my alternative goes to morality. Because that's where the action is. That's what's important. People do what they think is right, what they think is noble, what they think is good. And my question is this. It's a simple question. Why should I live for other people? Why should I be selfless? Why is sacrifice a good thing? Why is sacrifice noble? Why are other people's lives more important than mine? Why is it okay to break my legs? Why should I volunteer to have my bread legs broken, which is what happens every day? Why is in my life mine? And in my view, ethics has got everything upside down. Morality should be about and this was the view of Aristotle way back. Morality well, should be about how do we make an individual's life the best that it can be for him? Or how did he make it that way? What are the principles to guide human beings towards happiness, prosperity, success? How do we make individual lives the best that they can be? What are the principles that allow for that? What we need, in my view, is a new morality, a new ethic. Because this one is corrupt and destroying us. And the more we practice it, the more we'll destroy it. What we need is an ethic of rational self-interest. Of a real, of guiding our lives to maximize our flourishing as human beings. Now quickly, what would that require? And then what kind of economic system would that necessitate? What is the one thing that makes human values possible. You know, from, from the iPhone you're wearing to the building that we live that we're in right now that shields us from the rain and cold out there in Bergen. What is it possible? What is it that makes possible human life and certainly human success? How do we produce these things? How do we make them? Where does it come from? Because if you look around the room, if you look at your neighbor, you can look. Nothing won't happen. We're pretty pathetic animals. We're weak. We're slow. We have no claws. We have no fangs. We have no massive fur to survive the Scandinavian winter. Us versus the saber tooth tiger, just on the physical level, we're finished. Try running down a bison, biting into it. We can't do it. So what is it that allows us as human beings to survive and to thrive and to have all this wealth around us and have all these warm clothes and have the warm buildings and the heating and be able to drill for oil in the North Sea and figure out what used to be black sludge, ugly, horrible stuff, figure out how to make stuff that allows for transportation and lighting and heat and everything else that sustains our civilization. Where does that come from? It comes from up here. It comes to our reasoning mind. So to be successful as a human being, I believe one has to rank reason as one's primary value. One has to be rational. One has to live for oneself rationally, using reason, using logic. And so step one is one has to think. Step two, I've already mentioned, we have to, I mean, human beings to survive have to change their environment to fit their needs. We have to go chop down trees and build huts, or carve out mountains to build brick buildings, stone buildings. We have to go drill in the North Sea. We have to produce, we have to act, we have to be out there making stuff, building stuff, creating stuff. 
And it, we, are, we are designed to build stuff, make stuff, create stuff. And when we don't, we suffer. And this is why it's so crucial to human happiness that you as an individual go out and produce and make and build. That you create value for other people and trade with them. So producing, working in other words, having a career, taking it seriously, is crucial for human happiness. And then how do we treat other people? Well, fundamentally, I think the way to treat other people is with extracting without force. Force is the one enemy of both reason and production. Force is the one thing that really destroys human life. Coercion. People putting guns to one another's faces, or backs, or chests, or whatever. Force is ugly. Force is wrong. We all know this at some gut level. But force is destructive to the human mind. It prevents us from producing because it prevents us from thinking. So if we're going to deal with one another without force, then we should deal with one another voluntarily. Instead of sacrificing to one another voluntarily, which means a sacrifice, I give something and get nothing in return, or something less valuable in return, which means kind of lose-win transactions. I'm a loser, you're a winner, the other way around. I like, I like you know, the iPhone way of, of interacting with other people. I bought this iPhone for 300 bucks. How much was it worth to me? Over 300. Silent audience. Over 300, otherwise I wouldn't have bought it. How much is it worth to Apple? Less than 300, because they make a lot of profit on this. Who lost? Nobody. Win-win. Voluntary win-win transactions. Trade is a way in which we'll be treating one another. And trade is not just about material values. Trade is about friendship. We trade in friendship. If you give and you get nothing in return, you're not going to stay friends very long. Love is a trade. Love is incredibly self-interested. Imagine in your wedding night going up to your bride-to-be and saying, this wedding, huge sacrifice. I actually get nothing from you. You love somebody because they make you feel good. Because they make you feel great. What could be more self-interested than having somebody who makes you feel so good and bonding with them? It's a trade. And the economic system that is consistent with the idea of trade, with being voluntary, with being productive, with being rational, with using reason, with innovation, is a system where there's no redistribution of wealth. It's a system of capitalism, it's a system of free markets where people are left alone to produce, to innovate, to build, to create, to help their fellow man if they so choose to help their fellow man. But then it's out of a sense of joy, it's out of a sense of trade, not out of a sense of obligation, and duty, and sacrifice. It's a healthy, prosperous, happy society. And if people love working and trading, and remember, trade is a win-win, so every time you trade with somebody, the other person is better off. Nobody's made the world a better place. The world a better place in the last 30 years than Steve Jobs and Bill Gates. Not because of their philanthropy. That's insignificant. It's because they traded with us and made all our lives better. Because they used their minds to create great products. They were productive. They built stuff. And then they traded with us. So I believe that capitalism, that freedom, that free markets, ultimately produce a culture of individualists, individuals who love their life, who love their work, who love other people who are producing and are willing to trade with. It's a culture of love. Not a culture of sacrifice. Not a culture of some people working for others. Of some people being uh, stuff taken away from them for the sake of others. But the opposite. A culture in which we live for ourselves, we are happy, we're productive, we interact with other people in a healthy, productive way. So, tonight, 
I challenge you to, at the very least, rethink your welfare state. There are other, potentially much better options. Welfare, at the end of the day, is a sickness. It will destroy you. Economically, but much more importantly, it will destroy you morally. And there is an alternative. It's much more fun. I hope you at least think about it. Thank you all. time limit and I would just get to raise your hand or just walk up to the line and ask questions. But keep in mind the limitation of time. Please. Uh, hello. Um, my name is Tolo Rajevich and I'm a member of the Student Society. Um, first I would just like to thank you for a very interesting lecture. It certainly is quite a different perspective from what we used to hear in Norway, so um, um, uh, there's frankly quite a lot of questions I would like to ask you. But, um, I would like to keep to a topic where I have some professional experience, which is financial incentives and taxation. Um, you say that the Scandinavian welfare model, due to uh, a progressive tax system, inhibits growth and uh, pr productivity. Um, the top marginal tax in Norway is around 50%. It rises from about, I think, 27%. What's that? What's that about? The, the, the top uh, tax for income earners in uh, Norway is around 50%. 50? Yes, it rises from about around, uh, I think, 27%. Um, so I would like to take you back to the 50s and 60s in the US uh, when the top tax for income earners was 91%. Um, according to your logic, we should have taken the American economy back to the Stone Age, but that didn't really happen. In fact, it quite, the, um, quite the opposite uh, trend uh, occurred. Uh, this is one of the great areas of the American economy with the consistent growth and the establishment of uh, a consumerist middle class society. So how do you reconcile this objective economic uh, data with, with, with your worldview? Sure. That, that, that's my first question. Can I do one at a time? Because I, okay, I, sure. I don't yeah, have to do that. Yeah. Yeah. To hold more than one. So I think everybody heard because you spoke at the microphone. So that, thank you. Um, <clears throat> in the 1950s, the marginal income tax rate was indeed, uh, the top marginal income tax rate in the United States was 90%. But nobody paid 90%. The effective tax rate, that is the tax rate that people actually paid, was dramatically lower, well under 50% of what the rich paid, because it was 90% with loopholes this big. And nobody paid 90%. So uh, even, at the, even at the margin, nobody paid 90%. So you have, to, you have to look at what actually people paid, and you'll see it's dramatically lower. Uh, so yeah, you can have, on paper, very high rate for the income tax. The question is, what do people pay? If you create massive loopholes, it's meaningless to have that marginal rate. And part of the reason for lowering marginal income tax rates in the United States was not so people would pay less taxes, was to simplify the tax code and get rid of the loopholes. And indeed, Ronald Reagan's famous um, uh, uh, 1984, I think it was, uh, tax bill was called the Tax Simplification Act. And while it lowered marginal income tax rates, the effective rates didn't change that much, and some rates actually went up, because he took away so many loopholes. So that's one. Second, why did the United States economy do so well in the 1950s? Um, I think there are a lot of reasons for it, but a big reason is that it was the only healthy economy in the world at the time. Because all the others had just been blown up. And they needed to trade. It was very, it had, a, it had this amazing competitive advantage over the rest of the world. It was pouring money, investment money, investment resources into Europe, into Germany, into France, into, into Japan, uh, and a huge advantage to itself. Uh, and it was generated enormous returns on that advantage. So the advantage now, I'm not for blowing up the world, uh, because I don't think wars create economic growth. Uh, but they just create economic growth for particular places in particular times. But overall, wars are always bad for the economy. They always depress uh, the total economically. So, so those would be the two things. Some of the other reasons uh, the 50s were, were generally positive. In certain areas, uh, you know, America was less regulated in the 50s than it was later on. 
Um, and, uh, and government controls and regulations of intervention in the economy were actually less than they were uh, later on. So those would be my two answers to, uh, to that. Are you going to follow up or will you get another question? Yeah, I think you can follow up with one question. And then if you have more, you're welcome to come back with other people. Well, we have the same topic here, which is health and state and its efficiency and so Thank you. Um, uh, thank you for an um, uh, informative answer. Um, now I would like to turn to social mobility. And I think you, I missed in your presentation, you did touch upon what you call the ambitious poor. And for me, that brings up one question, that, that is social mobility. Uh, US, the US, which uh, arguably is more capitalist than the Scandinavian countries, has one of the worst social mobilities in uh, the OECD, so the, the world's rich man's club. Um, and um, a person in the US, born, if a person in the US, one person is born into a poor family, and one poor person is born into a rich family. If the person from the, in the poor family takes a college education, um, and the person in the rich family does not take uh, col uh, college education, the person in the rich family still has three times the chance of ending up rich. Uh, 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 you, you didn't really address those kinds of topics. I would really okay, like so, to yeah, hear absolutely. Question. So let me just say a few things about, about uh, income mobility, because statistics are fun. You can do whatever you want with them. And, and uh, mobility is a good example of this. When you have a compressed, and this is just statistics 101 now, when you have a compressed redistribution of income, like you do in Scandinavia, that is the difference between the wealthiest and the difference between the poorest is very small, then mobility is very easy. It's not, it doesn't take much because it's compressed. I mean, that's just a fact. Just, just numbers. We're not talking about policies or anything. The numbers. It's just it's very easy to go from here to here to here to here because the difference is small. When you have much more inequality, which we do in the United States. It's a much further distance to get into the next quartile because the quartiles are more, you know, substantial. <laughs> Just numerically, social mobility, independent of how actually better people's lives are going to be, just the mathematics of it work that the United States will have lower social mobility than other countries just because of the mathematics of it. Uh, there is amazing social mobility in the United States. Um, primarily through education, I think that's true all over the world. Uh, people do much better if they're educated in college than if they're not. Uh, but a lot of the richest people in the United States today are not college educated. So college is not a prerequisite, they're not a requirement. Uh, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, and many, many others of the entrepreneurial uh, group uh, of wealth creators are not. But look, I'm not going to defend social mobility in the United States. It's terrible. It's terrible. And it's terrible because of the welfare state. Because of what I said before. When you write people checks to keep them poor, they stay poor. When you provide them with incentives to get rich, they become rich. So the real comparison should be, take the United States when it was, when it didn't have a welfare state. So pre-1960. Or even take it further into the 19th century the second half of the 19th century. And there you see massive social mobility, much higher than you have today in, the United, in, in Scandinavia. Every single one of the rich so-called robber barons that we know today, with the exception of J.P. Morgan, all born dirt poor with nothing, and they all became the richest people in the world. J.D. Rockefeller is a good example of this. A Carnegie is a good example of this. Many of the others are as well. By cheating and uh, not following... Is that a question? I mean, I'd be happy to answer the question about whether they cheated. Uh, not by cheating, by producing. The United States went from a third-rate colony in 1776 to the richest, wealthiest, most successful country in the world by 1914. Not because of lying, cheating, and stealing, but by producing, creating, building, and trading. And yes, the progressives and the socialists and the welfare status that we read in 19th century history to present the capitalists of the time as Robert Barron. But that's revisionist history. It's not true. They built, they created. You don't build a culture on lying, stealing, cheating, and are successful at it. It doesn't work that way. So back to your idea, when you have capitalism, when you have true free markets, social mobility is far greater. And another way around as well. There used to be a registry, a New York registry in the 19th century, 
of the kind of the people that were in, like the socialites, the people who were rich. And there was so much movement in the thing. That is, people would be in it, they would disappear from it because they lost their fortune, and then maybe a few years later they'd come back and then they'd skip. There used to be a saying from short sleeve to short sleeve in two generations. Short sleeve meant poor. Right? So you were poor, you became rich, but then you, you left your money to your kids and they lost it all. Because they did. It's very rare, very rare, to find children of rich people in the United States say as rich. And many of them, if you look at the Fortune 500 today, or the Forbes 400, or whatever, whatever measure of richness, very few of them are inherited wealth. Most of it's entrepreneurial wealth. Most of them made it or created it. And many people on the list from 20 years ago are not there anymore, even today. But in the 19th century, wham, this mobility was immense. And even in the 1950s, the era that you described as very good, social mobility was much higher. But remember, the 1950s, there was no welfare state in the United States. The, the, the significant welfare state, the welfare state we know today in America, is a product of the 1960s. It's a product of the Johnson administration, of Medicare, Medicaid, and, and welfare, all 60s. So in the 50s, there was almost no welfare in the United States. And yet the economy grew very fast. And you had much more social mobility in the US than you do today. Next one, please. Hello, I am. Um, um, uh, I actually almost forgot my question because that took some time. Um, I, if I could just first just say something. Um, I used to study, two and a half minutes, you can use yeah, yeah, I used to study development, and uh, I know for a fact that there was a study in Egypt where they actually gave poor people money, and those people went on to do much, much better than everybody around them. Just saying. But my actual question is that there's a lot of places, including one which I used to live, which was a poor island nation. Actually, not a nation, it was Bali, by the way. Uh, if you have heard of Bali. Good at Bali. Yeah. And in that place, there's absolutely no government restrictions at all for most of the poor people living there, most for the regular shop owners and stuff like that. Why aren't these people producing so much wealth when there's no welfare system? No tax, no real war or anything to bring them down. Why isn't your system just good. rushing these people? To yeah, it's a good question. So why do we take these countries in Asia or elsewhere where there's no welfare system, there's no real intensive regulations, there are no controls. It seems like they're all free. Why aren't they incredibly rich, right? My system would suggest that they all be incredibly rich. Because it's not enough not to have things. There's certain things you do have to have in order to become rich. You do need government to become rich. I'm not an anarchist. You need government to become rich. But what, it, what should government do that it doesn't do in Bali and it doesn't do in many of these countries? You need a government that helps define and protect property rights and the rule of law. These countries don't have a rule of law. They don't have property rights. And indeed, if you read a book, there's a wonderful book called Capital Ideas by Hernando de Soto. He's an economist from, I think, Peru. And he says one of the ways in which we could, we could um, help poor people all over Africa, all over the, the poor places in Asia and in South America, is by recognizing their property rights over their homes, over the land that they cultivate. If we just define it as property rights, suddenly these poor people who don't have any capital would have capital, land and buildings. And they could then use that capital to become entrepreneurs, to open businesses, to create, to build, and create wealth. And indeed, if you take countries like Bali, who were dirt poor, and you give them property rights, and you give, and you recognize their property rights, because they, everybody's got property rights. If you recognize property rights, and you have the rule of law, they become rich. And the best example of this that I can think of is Hong Kong. So Hong Kong 70 years ago was poorer than Bali. It was a little fishing village with nothing there. About 30, 40,000 people lived there. Today, seven and a half million people live in Hong Kong. It has more skyscrapers than New York City. And per capita GDP, which is a measure of income, well, is as high as the United States, higher than Norway. They're richer than you are. And yet they started with nothing. They started like Bali. But all they got, all the British did in Hong Kong when they 
took it over when they, after World War II, basically, is respect property rights, rule of law, British law, very, you know, separation of judiciary from governments. That's it. That's all they did. And people swam there. People came from Bali. They came from China. They came from Vietnam. They came from Thailand. And they came because they were free there. There was no, there's a tiny little safety net. There's a little bit of health benefits, but very small as compared to Western countries. And yet they're rich and they're thriving. So it's not enough to have a negative. It's not enough not to have welfare, not to have this, not to have that. You also have to have a positive, which is property rights and rule of law. Thank you. The next one. Hello. Uh, I would like to take a look at uh, your look on the welfare state. Uh, and you define it in a way I don't completely recognize. You say that's taking away money from someone and giving it to others. Uh, but I would say, uh, you based, you, based on that, you said that it's not rational and it's not serving self-interest. But I would say that our welfare state in Norway, at least, self-serve interest. Um, and the three reasons I have this is, first reason, uh, we have uh, universality, which means we have these arrangements uh, which gives not just some people, but all people, uh, tax money back. Uh, and that is based on that you can work some part of your life, but others you can't. You can't work when you're a child. You can't work when you're like eight years above if your health isn't good enough. Uh, so that's the first argument I said, it's universal. Uh, the second uh, is that it's rational because it's a common solution. Uh, instead of every person going around and finding their solution, uh, if I had a child, and I was going around looking for childcare. It would take me more energy than having a, like a common solution for it. And the third reason is that it's a trade-off. Uh, I think it's rational because I, for example, if I have children, I trade uh, my work, my tax money, for someone else taking care of my children and taking care of my parents when they're old instead of me doing it. So I look at it as rational and serving of self-interest. So there's no question. There's no question that, that I obviously disagree with everything you said. Um, um, yes, you can't work all of your life. When you're a kid, it's your parents' responsibility to take care of you. If they can't, they shouldn't have you. When I had kids, I had to think about it. I didn't have kids for many years. Because I was a student, I couldn't afford to have them. I chose when to have children, when I could afford to take care of them and give them the life that I think my children deserve. So it's your responsibility as a parent to take care of your children. And yes, I hope, you know, I hope to work until I'm very old, but there certainly are conditions in which I won't be able to work. I think work is an essential characteristic in human life. They've done studies of people who retire and don't work, don't pick up a hobby, don't, you know, they just play golf or whatever. They die very quickly. Uh, it's true. You need a purpose in life. You need a purpose in life to keep you going. So I, I hope I work until long into my 80s, but who knows. But you know what? I've worked since I was, in my case, as of, since I was 21, I've worked. So I have, until my 80, I've got 60 years to save money. If, if you didn't tax me, if you didn't come with a gun and take half my money away, you know how rich I could be when I'm 80? You know how good of a life I could have in retirement? It's the welfare state that's denying me the ability to save for retirement. And what does the welfare state do? I'll take Social Security in the United States as an example of this pension plan. It takes 12.5% of my income. It spends it. It wastes it. It, 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 it. it creates a huge bureaucracy around it. And then I get pittance when I retire. If I take in that 12.5% and, and put it in a simple bank account that returns the lowest interest you could imagine, I would have more smartly and got a little bit better return and I could be rich. That's just the 12.5%. I'm not talking about all the rest of the income that is being taxed. So from my perspective, nobody can take care of me better than me. But I'll give you some other examples. When you're young, as soon as you get a job, 12.5% is taken for Social Security. Plus, you pay other taxes. I want to start a business. I don't want to save right now. I want to save later. I want to take a risk. I want to be entrepreneurial. I want to start a business. 
you, the government, or whoever it is, the majority, has decided that no, I should not have a right to decide how to use my money, to invest it, to start a business, to put it into saving. No, you know what's good for me. You guys know how I should live. This is pure paternalism. It's pure authoritarianism. You are telling me how to live. You have decided that I have to put 12.5% to the government who then spends it. I have to pay 50% of my income so that you can do whatever you want to do. And I'm not allowed to start a business. And, and notice that if I'm upper class, if I'm rich, I can always borrow from my parents. I can get it from somebody else. I'll, I'll, I'll be fine. I, I will start my business. But if I'm poor and I have to rely on my own income to start the business, I will never start it because you're taxing all my money away. So the, the whole system is rigged against, this goes back to the previous question, against social mobility. It's rigged against ambitious poor being successful. The biggest victims of the welfare state are the ambitious poor. And they're the people I care about. I, you know, I came to America with nothing. So I know what it's like. It's hard work. And the welfare state makes it 10 times harder than it should be. Now finally, daycare and all this other stuff. I love my iPhone, as you might have noticed. I use it a lot in my talks. I didn't need the government to tell me where to buy this. I didn't need the government to tell me what features it should have. I mean, just imagine if the government had designed it, what it would look like. It wouldn't look like this. It wouldn't be as cheap, and it couldn't do as many things as it does. So, the iPhone is, as compared to child, child care, a lot less important. If they can't do this, why would I want them to do child care? I want Steve Jobs to do child care. <laughs> I want to go and find the best child care I can. I'm smart enough to pick an iPhone. I can certainly pick a child care for my kids. And the market will deliver me child care products that are far superior, look much more beautiful like this than anything the government can produce. So I don't want the government providing me that stuff because it's going to be at best mediocre. If you have a comment, we have some time. All right, so thank you. Next question, please. Hi, um, thanks for the interesting talk you, you gave us. It's, uh, it's refreshing to see someone uh, advocating more selfishness. Um, okay, but I, I want to so try an, a thought experiment on um, you. You talked about so this trading, we should do more trading, a lot of this trading. Would you say that if I give money to a um, non-profit organization to do charity, I sort of trade my money to get happiness in return. It's, it's selfish by me to uh, sort of buy my own happiness. <laughs> it depends. Yeah, but, but if I value that... Uh, it depends that's... why you value it. So remember that from my definition of being selfish, or being selfish, was reason, was rational. So if you've evaluated rationally, which most people don't do, if you've evaluated rationally, that yes, giving money to this charity, is good for me, and therefore I should do it. Say yes. So, so and that's that, two caveats, right? Yeah, but that was just uh, the setup. But um, <laughs> so, if uh, I get uh, something in return for giving money, then uh, what if we sort of get some professionals to to help us uh, distribute this money? Highly professional. Maybe uh, I can be a part in deciding who this who these uh, professionals should be. Let's maybe call it the uh, state or the government. Um, and these professionals uh, sort of uh, take some of my money, which uh, in, let's just say in Norway, many people feel that the, the, tax, the tax system is, is fair. Yeah. And many people sort of are happy to pay their taxes. So the, the, this organization, the, the state, if you will, takes my money and, and gives it away. Like, charity for Yes, it. and gives me happiness in return. Yeah. So, would you, wouldn't you say that this is uh, uh, a good way to, uh, to, no. to find myself happiness? <laughs> no. no, so I'll tell you why, don't worry. I'm not going to leave this in there. I always give reasons, and I disagree with my reasons, but I always give them. What is the state? What is government? What is the essential characteristic of government? We have we do all kinds of things in life, and then we have government. What is what characterizes government? What is government? From the, every all forms of government, from the from the most authoritarian to the 
to the freest, all forms of government, what unites them all? What, what is the essential thing that government is about? What's that? Yes, but it's not about, because we distribute money all the time, right? Uh, I'm, I, I don't know if you paid for, let's say you paid me to, I, there's, a, there's an example that I just heard somebody use. Uh, I come to speak to you, you all pay 50 bucks, and I'm charging, I don't know, whatever I'm charging, uh, all your money. We've just redistributed wealth, right? We've taken your 50 bucks and given them to me. But that's not what we mean by government, right? Government does something, it distributes wealth by a certain means. What is it that characterizes everything government does? Bureaucracy. Violence. Violence. Force. Government is force. The essential characteristic of government is force. We can disagree, but I have no right to pull a gun on you. But you disagree with the law that the government passes. For example, it's not managing my charity, and I don't like how it's managing my charity. I can't pull a gun. I can't do anything. They pull a gun. They, if I want to withdraw my funds, they pull a gun on me. Of course they are. You try not paying your taxes, what will happen to you? You go to jail. How do you get to the jail? Somebody pulls a gun on you and takes you. And if they don't pull a gun, they, 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 they take you by a hand and they drag you. They, they use force. Every government is a monopoly over the use of force. That's the definition of government. Whether it's Soviet government or the, or the Norwegian government or the American government. It's about force. The laws they write are enforceable by force. I don't... Apple can't force me to buy this. But if this was made by the government and they decided everybody has to have one, has to have one, then they could force me to have one of these. That's the difference between the market, which is voluntary, government, which is forced. So if we believe in charity, first of all, charity, by definition, is voluntary. And the setup you created was not voluntary anymore because you skipped a step there where you created voluntary. You bought in government, which now forces us to participate. We don't have choices. We don't get to decide. I don't like that person. I don't want to give him welfare. I only like these people. I want to give them more welfare. No, but the government says, no, we get to decide. We're the experts. But what if I disagree with the experts? I, you know, for example, I'm not an expert, let's say, in managing my money. So I can hire an expert to manage my money. But if I disagree with them, I can pull the money from them and give it to somebody else or manage it myself. You can't tell the state. Oh, I've changed my mind. Please give me my taxes back. I want to decide how to spend them. Because it's forced. Now, finally, let me say this. You wanted reasons. I'm giving you reasons. <laughs> we care about minorities, supposedly, in democracy. Right? We care about minority rights. We care about the majority not overly inflicting itself on minorities. And we've created all kinds of minorities, ethnic minorities, uh, you know, sexual minorities, all kinds of minorities, right? But there's only one important minority we never talk about. That's me, you, the individual. What about, what about if all of you want to spend money on Project X? And I don't. I just don't want to spend money on Project X. I want to do Y. What gives you the right, because you're the majority, to impose your will on me? What gives you the right to take my money and put it into Project X when I don't want to do it? Don't I have rights? Minority rights. I don't want the majority telling me what to do. That's my reason. Sure. Yeah. yeah, okay, but this is, this is sort of the, the, the nature of democracy and republics, is that we cannot, uh, we can to a large degree sort of decide on how to spend and how to, uh, how to use the money in the States. Yes, so that's not but, true. But the, the, but the Republic, sort of uh, keeping in, in mind that you cannot use force on people who don't want to sort of use, use the money this and, or that way. But, but my, my point on, on, this, on this redistributing or, or buying happiness is that the state is just an arbitrary tool. It's, not, it's just a, it's a better way to, to reach more of a... Uh, to, to reach more ideas. But if it was a better way, that if it always involved was, was being more efficient and securing happiness, then it would be a foundation in a sense, kind of a state foundation that would allow you voluntarily to participate or not. Because if you don't get happiness from it, then it's not very efficient for you. 
and therefore you would choose not to participate. But the fact that it's not voluntary suggests that something else is going on here. But I forget the first part of your question, which I disagree with. We'll go back. <laughs> Next question, please. Oh, republics. If anybody wants to ask me about democracy, I'll be happy to comment. Yes. I know it's hard. <laughs> do, you, do you think that the democracy in the Western world, or Norway, for example, is something we haven't chosen for ourselves? Yeah, as a, some of you have, and some of you haven't. I mean, that's... And how, we, uh, how should we choose our form of government? Okay, good. That's a good, good question. So, the problem with democracy is... It was, was, was made real, I don't know, 2,000 something years ago. Wait. Make that. That's too good. No, no. Yeah. No, a democracy. Let me, let me finish. Okay. And then you can comment. I haven't even said anything. How do you know it was an oligarchy? Socrates is walking around the streets of Athens. And he's arguing with people. He's challenging people's religion. He's challenging their beliefs. And the citizens of Athens get together and they say, this has to stop. He's corrupting our youth. So they voted on what to do with him. They basically had a trial and it was a vote, right? Democracy. And they voted to silence Socrates. But of course, you can't silence Socrates. It's in his nature to argue. So what must you do? By a large majority, I can't remember the number, 360 out of 500, something like that, they voted to kill him. That is democracy. I'm against that. I believe you have a right to free speech. Even if I and the majority of people find what you say, or in this case what I say, offensive, and I know in Norway what I say sounds offensive. The question is, is in Norway, is it okay for all of you to get together and vote to kill me because you don't like what I say? Now we've accepted that the answer is no, I hope. <laughs> I'm flying out tomorrow morning. Um, the place where you have that possibility is actually, at least not in, not in Norway. Uh, no, not in Norway, because we put limits on democracy, right? We said, you know what, when it comes to speech, majorities don't matter. I... What? Why? What? In Norway, it Norway, actually matters. Oh, it matters. You guys have kind of speech. Yeah, yeah, we do. Uh, well, then it's sad for you. It's sad for you. It's horrible. Free speech. Well, let the speaker finish. Right? Why? Again, because I should have a right. It's my life. I should have the ability and the right to say what I want to say. And if you're offended by it, then don't listen. Or go do something else. But you have no right to impose your will on me just because you can convince 51%. Violence is never a solution, even if the majority wants it, even the majority thinks it's right. And I think that's true of property rights just as much as it's true of speech. If I have $100 in my pocket, it's wrong, morally wrong, for 51% of you to vote to take my $100. It's theft. It's stealing. It's mine. This is no. the time I'm saying. Yeah, you have to limit democracy. Limit it a lot. A lot. It's both democracy and also uh, a result of free speech and the... Uh, no, it's not a result of free speech. It's yes, it is. It's a negation of free speech. There's, oh, no, yes. there's no point in free speech. There's no point in free speech if I can't offend you. Because if we're never going to offend one another, you don't need protection. We're all going to be happy and blah, 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 right? The only reason to have free speech laws is to protect us when we offend one another. You have a right to offend. That's what free speech means. And if you have hate speech, you're negating the very nature of freedom. You're negating and you're setting yourself up for authoritarianism. Yeah. You're setting yourself up for, for, the, for the vote to serve them. Yeah, but why well, I mean, when it's a result, result, so I think we can move to the 51%. Collecting something as a result of... 51% is gang rule. You happen to have a bigger gang than my gang, so you get to rule over me. I'm against gang rule. No, I'm for freedom. And democracy, pure democracy, is not freedom. It's authoritarianism. Thank you for your last question. I don't think I'm going to offend you very much. But, uh... <laughs>
I'm actually, uh, I agree with a lot of the moral, moral principles of uh, Ayn Rand and uh, individual freedom and freedom from coercion. Um, what I would like to ask is, uh, it seems a little bit like you're uh, trying to um, try to tell how people are going to live uh, their lives when you say that it's not good to be lazy and you have to be productive. I mean, can people just, uh, you know, of course, people are free and can they just uh, be lazy? So let me ask you this. If a doctor tells you that eating, what, 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 what is their consensus today in bad feet? But so, if a doctor tells you, let's do this, if a doctor tells you don't smoke, it's bad for you. Do you find that offensive? No, you don't, because he's an expert. My view is in philosophy, ethicists, the profession of being an ethicist, is to advise you, not to force you, not to coerce you, not to impose on you any more than your doctor can coerce you into not smoking, although the state is trying. <laughs> Advise you, hey, by the way, based on everything I know about the world, based on all my experience of human psychology and philosophy and the nature of man, being lazy is not good for you. And that's what I'm saying. Can you elaborate a little bit uh, more or less? <laughs> <laughs> on why this particular one? I think you're asking a bigger question. Why is it okay for people to say, this is how you should behave. And that's saying, just like a doctor tells you how to behave. Think of, a, think of an ethicist. Whether I'm right or not is irrelevant right now. Right? I might be a bad ethicist. Whatever the advice I'm giving you might be wrong. The point is that there is a profession called an ethicist, a philosophy of, a philosopher of ethics, Aristotle, whoever, whose job it is to say, look, how did Aristotle do it? Being a coward is not good for you. Being a... Um, uh, um, uh, Reckless is not good for you. You've got to find courage somewhere in between, and that will build your character and make you a good person. No, whether it's true or not is not the point. That's the job of ethics, and saying this is the path to happiness. This is the path to good life. You don't have to follow it. You can go smoke. You can be lazy. You can do whatever you want. But, but, the, but this is philosophically, based on our knowledge of human beings, this is what leads to a good life, to flourish. That's, all, that, that's what ethics does. I think we should take it seriously, because I think it's the most important subject in the world, because it deals with the methodology of how to live well. And I don't think there's anything more important than living well. Thank you. 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 Because uh, you admit that uh, people vote uh, uh, for paying taxes, yeah. uh, even rich people vote for yeah. paying taxes. Yeah. But at the same time, you characterize it as, as uh, stealing and uh, force. Just saying that it's guilt, I think that's a little too easy to just I don't feel that guilt. Well, most most successful people in America, I don't know about Norway, feel guilty. And I can give you lots of examples of this that they do and they vote. But the, that's not the point. The point is this. I voted against the taxes. They're stealing from me. They're stealing from the 48% that voted against. 52% are saying it's okay to steal from those people who don't want their money stolen. Yeah, if you want your money to be stolen from you, then all you have to do is write a check. I mean, Warren Buffett keeps saying the rich should be rich, should be taxed more. Well, if you want to pay more taxes, all you have to do is pull out a check, or write a check to the federal government. They will take it. They will cash the check, so do it. But what we do when we vote is we impose our will on other people. We coerce other people to do what we think is right. And I think that's wrong. I think it's wrong to impose your will on other people. And in that sense, I believe in a very shrunk down democracy. You shouldn't be able to vote to take people's stuff. You shouldn't be able to vote to restrict people's speech. You shouldn't be able to vote on these kind of things. Government should be very small, should have very little to do, because it can't take people's stuff. It can't impose itself by force on people. Yeah. Thank you. Next question. Hello. Hi. Um, you said the welfare state is about fairness and justice. Uh, it's supposed to be. Supposed to be, yeah. So what kind of justice? So 
So what is justice? Good question. Um, and why sacrifice yourself? Um, I would answer to preserve the collective, the group, the community. The individual man, according to you, and I think you're right, wouldn't stand a chance against the saber-toothed tiger. But man could win this fight through working together, which is also the welfare state that would support the group. Uh, most moral, moral philosophers, preachers, and mothers seem to focus on the fairness of outcome for the good of the group. Could you elaborate on why you think your kind of justice is better? It's a good question because it gets to the core. Because I think that other stuff is injustice. It's not that my justice is better, my justice is justice and yours is not. Um, <laughs> So, uh, let's go to the saber-toothed tiger for a minute. Uh, if we fought the saber-toothed tiger democratically and collectively, we wouldn't be here. We fought the saber-toothed tiger by some individuals, not everybody, some people, it's always some people, using their minds, figuring out how to hunt him down, figuring out how to build weapons. We don't, we don't figure out how to build weapons collectively. We didn't figure out agriculture collectively. We didn't even build this collectively. Now, yes, a lot of people built this, but it took one person with a vision to make it all happen. And he paid everybody else to help him do it through voluntary trade. He didn't force them to participate. He didn't force them. Any, any Apple employees here? You're forced? What are you afraid? You get paid well. In a trade, you bring your labor, they give you cash. They don't have kids in Southeast Asia that actually makes that thing. What's that? They actually kids in Southeast Asia that actually makes that So thing. kids in Southeast Asia don't make these things. But you're right, poor people in Southeast Asia make them in China. There are no kids in the factories of Apple in China. But yeah, you should talk to those people. Once. You should talk to them. I encourage you all. I encourage you all to go to China and go to Foxcom, I think, factory. And talk to people, because you guys never do that. You sit here. I get angry, I'm sorry. You know because that. I do know it. You guys sit here. You guys sit here in middle class Europe in a comfy lifestyle, and you judge the lives of these Chinese workers who are far better off for working at, Com at Foxconn than they ever were before Foxconn existed. That are that are enjoying the fact that they can now create something, learn skills, build skills and strive to middle class lives, these people love what Foxconn is doing for them. Without Apple going to China, these people would still be starving in a system that is collectivized. China used to be collectivized. And it killed 60 million people in starvation because of the communes, because they collectivized farming. What made farming productive in China, the reason people can live in China, the reason more people have risen out of poverty over the last 30 years than in any period in history is because they broke up the collectivization. They got rid of the communes. They created the equivalent of private property over the farmland. And suddenly people became creative because they owned it and they made stuff from it. Collectivization is death. Every place where it's tried to its limit, it results in death. And that's what you're advocating for, particularly in China. And the reason I'm angry is because I just was in China, and you can see, you can see what's happened there. You can talk to people, and you can see the benefits of, of, of capitalism that is had in China are unfathomable. Hundreds of millions of people who used to be starving are now middle class. And yes, from Norwegian, from Norway, it's very comfortable to sit back and look at over there and say, ooh, they're only getting paid three bucks a day. But the alternative is to starve. Three bucks a day is a lot of money, and while you're making three bucks a day, you're learning a skill that makes it possible for you one day to have a thousand bucks a day, a million bucks a day, a day there's no limit. Social mobility in, in China is very high. I forgot yes. the question. Can okay. you remember the yeah, question? Yeah, we'll have the last question. Anyway. Yeah, um, I have some comments uh, yeah. for you. Uh, Democracy and capitalism, they are two things that are... Excuse me, I should have introduced myself. My name is Ant-Hubert I'm a master of uh, history. 
I am an undergraduate in public science and now I'm going to make a degree in the art of science in the University of Bergen. Well, <laughs> so that's it. And also from... from Could you get to the question? Yes, my comments is... It's true that both capitalism and democracy is their own enemies. Uh, and, um, but I was... Um, I had a tie break in uh, um, um, for a minute ago when you were discussing the democratic problem. I think the democratic issue and the symbol of democracy is to considerate the minority. If you don't considerate, if you don't benefit the minority all the time, you don't have any democracy. You I agree completely, but there's only one minority, the ultimate minority, the individual. And that's why I'm a strong believer in the system of government that was founded in America, in the original form. Where in its founding documents, what are protected, not communal rights, not anything, not community, not sacrifice, but the rights of the individual. You have a right, an inalienable right. What does inalienable mean? In the Declaration it says, all men have inalienable rights. What does inalienable mean? It means you can't take them away even by vote. So majorities can't apply to this. Inalienable rights means that they're yours no matter what the majority thinks. And you have an inalienable right to your life. Now what does that mean? Again, John Locke, this isn't even American, but what does John Locke mean by that? It means you have a right to be free, to act, to pursue your life, free of coercion. Because it's coercion that destroys life. So you have a right to be free. What does liberty mean? You have an inalienable right to liberty. You have a right to speak. <laughs> Even if you offend, you have a right to speak. You have a right to think. You have a right to have whatever religion you want, whatever set of ideas you want. That's what liberty means. Inalienable, no matter what the majority thinks. And you have a right to pursue your happiness. Pursue your happiness. That is, you have a right to act, to work, to do what you believe is necessary, to pursue the values that you think will lead to your success and happiness in life, free of what? Of coercion. Now, all of those are contradicted by the welfare state. All of those are, are, are contradicted by a pure form of democracy. The whole idea of individual rights is to protect the individual from the majority. Who is going to impose their will on them, not allow them to pursue happiness, not allow them to pursue their life, not allow them to have liberty, and we're seeing it all over the world. Right? You can't speak. We don't have property anymore. The state can take it any time. And you can't pursue happiness, because they decide what's happiness. It's charity, and therefore they're going to manage it for you, and they're going to take your money for you. They're going to break your legs for you. Uh, hi. Um, you can pronounce my name, but it's Boot. Um, uh, I'm a history student, uh, and I love people like you because we're so extremely fundamentally different. And I think, think that's extremely intriguing. That's really good. Uh, uh, well, uh, my question is, um, I think that um, what you said about um, poverty in the United States and how they should pursue it for themselves instead of being handed checks is extremely uh, intriguing. But this only applies for some of the individuals. What about the rest would a welfare state <laughs> enthusiast ask? Can I rephrase your question like this? What would happen to the people who can't? Yeah. Who literally can't exactly. work, can't advance, can't produce enough to make their lives something. Yeah. Um, first of all, I believe that very, very few people, very few, I have a very positive view of mankind. I think people can produce, they can work, if given an opportunity they will. People have a mind, at whatever level they can, they can make something of themselves. And I think history suggests that that's the case. When immigrants came to America in the 19th century,